Well, good morning. This is not the way I had planned to uh, share with you this morning. This is not where I anticipated I would be. Um, but um, if you didn't know, I, I've been coughing all week and I, uh, I took a COVID test on Wednesday and came up negative. And on Friday, I was literally coughing my lungs up and by Saturday I had a fever. So here I am, this is the world we live in. But I did wanna bring um, this message this week because we're in this series on growing up Jesus and I wanted to keep us on track in the life of Jesus leading up to the beginning of his ministry. And so while this is the second Sunday in the season of Epiphany, I hope that you'll indulge me for a moment because I'd like to take us back to Christmas time, the 12 day season of Christmas. Because there's one tradition that I failed to touch on as we celebrated Christmas this year, and that's the annual tradition where normally kind and understanding pastors and theological leaders, well, they begin to snark on Facebook about the most famous of the contemporary modern Christmas songs probably out there. The song is Mary, Did You Know? Mark Lowry wrote it with the Gaither vocal band back in around 1990, and it, I have to imagine it's the most covered song since then. I know there are at least a hundred versions of it out in, uh, out in the world right now, and not without reason, because it is a beautiful song. But every year at Christmas time, the pastor memes start reminding us that, yes, Mary did know. Gabriel told her, and she sang about it in the Magnificat, though I don't imagine she knew everything. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter because the beauty of this song, for me anyway, is the image of Mary holding her infant child. And I imagine a lot of us here have held a baby at some point in our life, whether it's ours or someone else's, and wondered, who will this child grow up to be? What future lies before her? Has anyone ever dreamed a dream about the beautiful things that your child or that a child would experience? The beautiful person that child would become? Has anyone ever held an infant child and prayed that the Lord would watch over him all his days? That's why I think Mary Did You Know is such a part of our culture because it hits us in a familiar place. But to be honest, this isn't the moment in Mary's life that typically has me wondering, Mary, did you know? It's not Mary holding her infant son. Rather, it's a moment from our scripture reading for today. And it's from the Gospel of John, which doesn't even tell the story of Jesus' birth. John doesn't even mention Mary by name, and he just calls her the mother of Jesus. In fact, Mary only shows up twice in John's gospel. The second time will be at the foot of the cross. But the first time is here, at a wedding in Cana. Jesus has gone out to the wilderness to be baptized by John the Baptist. That same day, he called Simon and Andrew to follow him. The next day, it was Philip and Nathaniel. And on the third day after his baptism, Jesus goes to a wedding back home with his mom. This is John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, 
Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, quicken our understanding that we may hear from you today. Speak a word to each of us. Invite us to believe in the signs that reveal your presence in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in case you didn't know, weddings in Jesus' day were multi-day affairs. And typically, the entire community was invited. Weddings were a time for everyone to come together and celebrate. And so there was a lot of pressure on families to make sure it was a good celebration. That's why running out of wine before the party is over is so devastating. It could be a stain on the family's name for years to come. And this auspicious, inauspicious beginning could haunt a young couple. And so, with this first appearance of Mary we learn that she is a sympathetic and an empathetic woman. She cares for others, and she is embarrassed for them. And so, she naturally involves her son, whom, like all mothers, she knows her son is special. But this is where I wonder, just how much did Mary know? I mean, because here she is in her late 40s at yet another wedding with her son, Jesus. And Jesus, we know, is around 30. When Mary was 30, she was already married. She already had at least one son, and she'd already almost lost that son at the temple in Jerusalem. And by the time Mary was 30, she had talked to angels. She had seen old men dream dreams about her son, and old women prophesy over him. She had fled to Egypt and come home again. And here she is with her 30-year-old son, Jesus, the one who'd been dreamed over, prophesied over, at yet another wedding that's not his wedding. As a child, that's like a nightmarish scenario, right? A mom fussing, fussing over her kid's love life and every reminder of her disappointment is one more twist of the knife. Now, I don't know how stereotypical Jewish mothers were back in Jesus' day, but my friend Matt in our grad school days, he had what he would call a stereotypical Jewish mother. And that's how he met his wife, Dana, who also, by the way, had what she would call a stereotypical Jewish mother. Matt and Dana were both pushing 30, both still single, both Jewish. Matt was an East Coast Jew in the theater program at Pitt with me, and Dana was from Canada and in the English program at Carnegie Mellon. Matt and Dana had never met, but both of their mothers were concerned of enough about their love lives to sign them up on jdate.com without their knowledge. Jdate was still in its infancy, but has gone on to become a global matchmaking website for Jews. It's like the eHarmony, only which a very much smaller demographic. And both Matt and Dana had no idea they'd been signed up until they got their respective emails. You've been chosen. Now, parents, I'm not advocating this course of action if you're concerned about your child's daily life. But I can't deny that it did work for Matt and Dana. They're still going strong 20 years later. And I can't help but hear a little of Matt's situation and Mary and Jesus' short conversation at the wedding. Things are already tense between Mary and Jesus when they get there. And when me, Mary says to Jesus, they have no more wine, Jesus, like, if we want to be honest, he responds kind of harshly, woman, why do you involve me? Ouch. Like, is anyone here brave enough to talk to your mom like that? Woman, 
Why do you involve me? There's a history behind those words. There's some tension in those words. This is a sore spot. Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. It gets worse because we know that when his hour does come, when it is finished, that's the next time we'll see Mary. Three years later, in her son's last agonizing moments on the cross. Jesus is clearly indicating that as the Messiah, he did not come down to earth to help out a couple of neighbors at the risk of a major social faux pas. Like I can almost hear him saying, their lack of planning is not my emergency, mom. And really, at a wedding mother, this again? Why are weddings always so tense between the two of us? I can't help but be a bit sympathetic though to Mary because I can't help but wonder how much did Mary know? Did she know that Jesus would start healing and saving until after his 30th birthday? Did she know that Jesus would never be married, not in the earthly sense? Did she know that Messiahs don't have babies? And so here, at yet another wedding that wasn't Jesus's, was this another always a bridesmaid, never a bride moment for Mary? Or, or rather, always a guest, never a mother of the bridegroom? What did Mary know? Because whether we want to admit it or not, I imagine we've all been there. Maybe we're that kid who knows we're not living up to our parents' expectations in this area or that. How many of us have heard this phrase, by the time I was your age, and then just insert improbable childhood accomplishment there. Or even if our parents never would say the words, we know in our hearts at times that we just can't measure up. Like, I know that if I were born a girl, my name would have been Kirsten. The fact that I still know my girl name at 46 years old means that I was already a disappointment mere seconds after I was born. Or, and this is much harder because maybe we've had those moments when things go so desperately wrong where we look down at our child and, and through the tears and the brokenness we whisper this is not what I wanted for you in life knowing that my kids never got to meet their grandfather one half of the duo who wanted me to be a Kirsten one of those moments for me. This is not what I wanted for you in life. Maybe you've had one of those moments. What did Mary know? Well, as it turns out, Mary knew quite a bit. What she does next makes that clear. Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus' obstinate words are still hanging in the air. Only Mary doesn't respond, not to Jesus. Instead, Mary goes straight into mom mode, turns from Jesus to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Like we've talked about how Jesus was fully human and fully divine, this was a very fully human moment because Mary knows. Mary knows her son will do exactly what she asks him to do, but more than that, Mary knows that Jesus, and perhaps only Jesus in all the fullness of his divinity, is able to do something in this situation. Mary knows something that we could all stand to remember. That when you do what Jesus tells you to do, miracles happen. And the miraculous does happen. Jesus' first miracle happens. He tells the servants to fill the six ceremonial cleansing jars with water, and the water becomes wine. We're even told that the master of the banquet didn't know where the wine had come from. But the servants knew. 150 gallons of wine. And Mary knew. And everyone was astonished that the bridegroom saved the best wine for last. Who does that? 
brings out the best wine when everybody is too drunk to know the difference. And John tells us, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. His glory was revealed. This was an epiphany. Christ was made known in the turning of water into wine. And this, John tells us, would be a sign of the abundance to come. A sign of a Messiah who would continually pour himself out for us. A Messiah who is still pouring himself out, still changing the tepid waters of our lives into reasons to celebrate. Of course, Mary knew all that. Mary knew that if people would only do what Jesus tells them to, miracles would continue to happen. Jesus would tell a man who hadn't walked for 38 years to stand up, take your mat, and walk. He did what Jesus told him to do, and a miracle happened. Jesus told a man blind since birth to go and wash himself in the pool of Siloam. He did what Jesus told him to do, and a miracle happened. The disciples only had five loaves and two small fish to feed 5,000 people. Jesus told them to have the people sit down. The disciples did what Jesus told them to do, and a miracle happened. And so, I can't help but wish sometimes that I would remember what Mary knew. That when life gets hard, and I feel like I'm not living up to anyone's expectation. When I feel like this is not the life that anyone wished for me. Maybe if I just do the things that Jesus told me to do, miracles would happen. When I look around at the world and at my kids and I think, this is not the world I wished for my kids. Maybe if I would just do the things that Jesus told me to do, miracles would happen. Maybe if we would just do the things that Jesus told us to do, miracles would happen. And these tepid waters that we so often find ourselves in would turn into celebration, abundant celebration. Amen.